Okay, so on our last video we uncovered a few of the many terrible secrets held by the UNT, including the many different tasks that each of the UNT kinds have to endure within their civilization and why they don't just create abomination after abomination on their quest for world domination. Today we will talk about what do UNT do. We will cover some of their main types of plots, we will cover how they perform slavery, we will even touch on some of the drugs that they create, but most importantly today we will talk about why they are so evil, what makes them this way, but before we do that, this video is brought to you by Sebastian Krause's Guide to Drakenheim, the new Kickstarter made by Ghostfire Gaming in collaboration with the Dungeon Dudes, which of course you may know of. If you were a fan of the original Drakenheim book, then this one should enhance your experience playing in the setting tenfold. But even for adventures not set in the setting, this is a player's options book that should enhance your game regardless. It contains a new class called the Apothecary, which is a spellcasting class inspired by doctors, occultists, and mad scientists. There are new subclasses for every single class in the player's handbook, from the Path of the Old Gods Barbarian to the Flashbacked Warlock to even the College of Doomsayers Bard, which sounds amazing. Uh, the book includes a plethora of new spells for you to play with, new feats that pertain to tools, which we don't have many as it stands, and of course, a lot more information on the setting of Drakenheim, including what you can find outside of the city proper. Check out the Kickstarter, the, the link is in the description below. Uh, new heroes are needed as the madness of Drakenheim spreads into an unprepared world. I mean, look at this mini. That's You shouldn't even call this a mini, this is like a grandy. <laughs> Anyways, now back to the video. Now, let's move forward and talk a little bit about the day-to-day -day life for the UNT. Quote, Although the serpent people perform their share of human sacrifices on their dread god's bloody altar, their depredations go far beyond such trifles. They scheme elaborately in the surface world to bring about destruction and corruption at all levels. From a petty campaign to harass a tiny village to a plot to subvert an entire nation, no scheme is too big or too small to escape the attention of the serpent people. As some of their crimes are blatant blatantly ghastly, others are so subtly corrosive that the hand of the UNT might never be seen in them." End quote. The UNT basically spend their time creating plots to dismantle society and destroy other civilizations. This is really their main focus and they are exceptionally good at it. I want to pull your attention back again to the 5th edition monster manual. You will notice that the UNT purebloods have above average intelligence, with the half-bloods having a bit high and then the abominations having exceptional intelligence. On all of the monster manuals, the UNT were described as having genius level intelligence. And these guys are meant to be masters of planning, intellect, and as we talked about it on our last video, pragmatism. And their plans are meant to be perfect, and those plans are all that they think about. Now, what's very interesting about the way that they go about doing this has to do with the why. So, you and T primarily have three gods. You have Dendar, Mershalk, and Seth. The main god that I want to talk about here is Mershalk, since he has always been basically the primary deity for the UNT. Uh, generally speaking, uh, this is the god that typically creates the UNT, depending on the setting that you're playing, though, as I mentioned before, uh, this is a bit different on the Forgotten Realms, but we will talk about that in our next video. For now, though, what is important here is that this was their first god, or their primary god, a few millennia ago. The truth of what is happening with Mershalk is a bit unknown. Many UNT believe that he is in a state of slumber and that they have to satiate him in order to wake him up. Others believe that he has achieved a higher state of being by effectively combining himself with his realm in the abyss. Uh, Mershalk basically is kind of like a demon, so he, he does have his own realm in the abyss, and he found a way to basically become truly immortal by becoming one with his lair. Other UNT believe that Seth effectively absorbed or, or ate or supplanted Mershalk, and that is why Mershalk is mostly absent. Now, those UNT would then, of course, follow Seth instead. I should also mention that, of course, as you can imagine, there are UNT that also follow Dendar, there's a lot of them, but we're gonna cover those also in our next video. Now, the reason why I'm I'm bringing all of this up is because Mirshulk and his teachings are crucial to the way that society functions within the UNT civilizations. If you were wondering why the UNT are cruel, why do they wish to destroy civilizations, why do they torment others, well, this is why. 
According to the religious teachings of the ancient UNT priests, and, and listen close to this, every act of gratuitous cruelty or destruction committed in Mirshalk's name brings the deity closer to awakening. The cleverer and the more perfectly executed the scheme, the more power it grants to the sleeping god. The greater the number of intelligent beings hurt, traumatized, or outraged by the scheme, the better. And this is the thing, this is why the UNT are so fucked up. Only gratuitous evil works to empower Mershalk. If you do an act of evil, but that act of evil benefits you? If it has any tangible benefit to you or to the community, then it cannot be dedicated towards Mershalk. It just doesn't work. Uh, taking slaves, for example, would be an evil act, a great evil act, but it would not empower the evil deity. However, torturing them, dismembering them, and of course, killing them uh, would in fact empower the deity. Having slaves benefits the yuan so harming them nonsensically uh, would bring no benefit, which is ideal for the empowerment of the god. And the most interesting thing of all, the, the thing that really makes certain that the UNT are the most fucked up of all of the evil species within D&D, is that there is one exception to this rule. Uh, taking pleasure in doing gratuitous evil does not count as a tangible benefit for the UNT on this matter. So, so you can indeed take pleasure in torture and sadism during a sacrifice, and doing so would not reduce the power that it would bring to the snake god. And so logically what follows is a species of monsters that commit the foulest of evil acts, and because of their snake brain, they do not feel those negative human emotions, such as empathy or pity, since they are, well, not human, obviously. It is, though, important to note here that not all UNT do this, since not all UNT follow Mirshalk. Instead, nowadays, actually, most follow Seth, but Seth is believed by many to be an aspect of Mirshalk, or someone who absorbed Mirshalk, or someone that has taken that empty space that Mirshalk has left in his disappearance. All in all, much of what is Mershalk is represented in Seth. So all of this is important in order to understand the UNT. Like with many species, like with any race, not everyone agrees. And there are traditionalists within the UNT communities that follow the old Mershalk teachings to the latter, and then some newer bloods that follow the, the new principles set by Seth, which Again, we will talk about in our next video. But it is important to realize that with millennia of Mirshalk's teachings, this sort of thing sticks really, really hard. Now, this does bring us to slavery within the UNT kingdoms. Quote, Deeming petty labor to be a function best performed by their inferiors, the UNT keeps slaves to do their dirty work. Some lairs located far from civilization capture unwilling tribesmen or humanoids for slaves, keeping them cowed by beatings and the threat of violence. Most, though, use their nefarious white resin to create humanoid addicts whose need for the foul substance is so intense that they are willing to while away their final days in servitude to the serpent people." End quote. See, uh, this is the thing. So, so UNT are actually really good at working all kinds of poisons. There are some like the famous black broth, which turns humans into mini UNTs, which we will talk about later. And then there's also white resin, which is a drug that they are really good at manufacturing. So this particular drug, the white resin, is a gummy substance made from the combination of rare herbs mixed with UNT venom. Uh, for the effects of the drug to manifest on a person, uh, they have to either ingest it or inhale it. Inhaling the drug would be mostly the way users of the drug would go about consuming it, while ingesting is more common with UNT either tricking or forcing others to consume it. Uh, many UNT, for example, will spike alcoholic drinks with white resin, or a female pureblood might put the resin on her lips and then make out with a person in order to get them afflicted with it. Now, the drug itself is meant to feel amazing to the user, since the actual goal for the UNT in this scenario would be to get people addicted to it. Now, what the drug actually does is a combination of like heroin and MDMA, where when you consume it, it, it kind of just leaves you indolent. Uh, you get blank dyed, you don't want to move anywhere or, or do anything, and then it also gives you extreme feelings of sexual euphoria. Quote, the user feels intense 
but unwholesome physical pleasure, end quote. So typically for a person that has never consumed white resin before, these feelings will last approximately 30 to 40 minutes, with the length of time decreasing the more you use it, to having it last to around just 5 minutes or so if you're a heavy user. Quote, During this period, the user is stunned and helpless, savoring the sickly joy coursing through his body. End quote. Uh, when the yuan tea sell it, the price is typically 100 gold pieces, but it is also worth noting, as you can imagine, that it is very illegal anywhere you go. Now, the play here for the yuan tea is to get people addicted, so that then they end up working as slaves for them. I mean, you know how it works. A person gets so addicted that they lose all of their money to the drug, to the point where they have to become basically servient to the drug lord in order to get more of it. It is particularly beneficial to the UNT here because uh, these slaves work with undying zeal just to get another taste of the drug. They work so hard, in fact, that most of them just end up dying from exhaustion a few years in. Quote, the UNT use white resin primarily to gain leverage over targeted individuals and make them accomplices in their sinister plans. As sometimes when the snake people need large quantities of gold to bring their schemes to fruition, they operate extensive black market operations to sell white resin, simply as a means of earning coin. Now and then, the UNT foster rampant addiction for ritual purposes, dedicating the evil energies so created to the racing of their god." End quote. But like many of the special alchemical marvels of the UNT, they have a way of turning people into more UNT, as you can imagine. See, UNT are, are not quite lycanthropes, they, they differ quite a bit, of course, from the lycanthropic curse, but they also share a fair amount of similarities in that UNT do have the ability to turn other humanoids into UNT, something that was done to them originally millennia ago. Interestingly enough, white resin does have a very small chance of making the consumer grow snake-like properties like fangs, uh, forked tongues, extra serpentine appendages, and the like. Uh, this is a side effect of the drug and definitely not intended, and so those that start these transformation processes uh, do end up eventually going slow of mind until they become a husk of their normal self, and then simply well die because they cannot feed themselves. Now this is actually a serious problem to the UNT because UNT shares something that we still haven't discussed, which is a religious veneration to anything reptilian. Quote, Although UNT view all mammals, even sentient ones, as innately inferior creatures, they pay great homage to their fellow reptiles. Uh, their religion forbids them from slaying reptiles and eating such creatures is a terrible taboo. Although many ordinary snakes eat their own kind, the UNT regard cannibalism with a violent dread. And they go to great lengths to track down, torture, and ritualistically slay any of their number who turn outlaw and deliberately bring harm to reptiles. However, their religious code does not require them to sacrifice themselves to protect other reptiles. Thus, it is not possible to bargain with a UNT by threatening to slit the throat of a turtle that you're holding." End quote. And so basically, if one of their slaves starts to grow snake-like features thanks to the uh, to their overconsumption of white resin, it's bad, because now what happens is the UNT now have to take care of this individual. They now have to treat it basically as an equal, they have to make sure that it is fed and unharmed. And like I said though, eventually these slaves do lose their minds and, and so it doesn't last long, but it is very taxing to the UNT ecosystem nonetheless. Now going back a bit to the other alchemical marvels that I mentioned that these guys produce is the dreaded Black Broth, though I do want to mention that the name Black Broth is actually specifically the name given to the concoction in the setting of Greyhawk. I don't believe that it has been given a specific name in the Forgotten Realms, but it is used in both settings nonetheless. Uh, this is basically the thing that UNT use in order to turn humans into other UNT, though not fully UNT, instead they turn you into a weaker, less intelligent version that then they can control. And the idea here is that if a UNT takes you prisoner, it'll try and then feed you this concoction. You make a saving throw against the poison and if you fail, you will be left in a coma for a few days as you start the process of transforming into a UNT. The process generally lasts for about 10 days. If you pass the save, then 
well, I suppose it depends what happens then. So in second edition, uh, you used to fall into a coma for one hour and then you died. In fifth edition, now you simply take a little bit of poison damage and, and you're fine. And they, they are really afraid of just straight up killing you here in fifth edition. They, they have nerfed a lot of this stuff. But yes, indeed, this process does appear in 5th edition. It is actually the Brood Guard. Though the actual name for these creatures are Histachi, which, uh, surprisingly, they actually do mention them down here in the text. Pretty nice. Uh, they actually kept everything from the original Histachi here, too, so there's really not that much for me to talk about. The Histachi traditionally had a rage mechanic, which they seemingly changed to a reckless feature, which is not quite as strong, granted, but hey, at least it is something. Uh, the lore, however, does very specifically state that his statue do not have the magical resistance associated with UNT and yeah, well, it is nice that they actually followed through with that. Look, only gaining resistance against charm and paralyzed effects, which is also true in the lore. Whoever was designing the Brood Guard actually cared about the lore, which is really nice to see. My only qualm would be that the Histachi are meant to look a, a bit more human than this. this. This just looks straight up like a reptile. But alas, just me nitpicking, I suppose. Now, I normally don't bring up Greyhawk into our conversations here for, for these videos. However, they do actually have a bit more info on the concoction that turns humans into UNT, specifically uh, what the broth is made from. So for the sake of completeness, I figured that I would show you. So the alchemical liquid is made out of 12 drops of UNT blood, 12 drops of human blood, petals and seeds of a withered sunflower, the eyes of 100 normal dragonflies, powdered bloodstone worth at least 250 gold pieces, a potion of human control, which I guess in 5th edition that would be some kind of uh, potion that gives you the spell dominate person perhaps. Uh, you would also need a large quantity of peat and human hair, and then two fairly rare ingredients. The first rare ingredient here would be the egg of an Amphisbaena. So this creature is a mythological reptile slash serpent that has two serpentine heads, a, a normal one and then one on its tail. Uh, this creature actually did make an appearance, believe it or not, in 5th edition. You could actually find it in Ghosts of Saltmarsh of all places. It was actually a guardian to a shrine to Semwania in the uh, Lizardfolk hideout. Quote, this creature appears as a huge snake with a head at each end of its body. Its scales are blackish blue with bands of lighter blue fading into its coloration near the middle of its body. Its heads are glossy black and its eyes are crimson. The Enfisbena is a giant poisonous snake about 10 feet long. It is often found lairing near a water source or in dark, damp locations. An Enfisbena moves on land by grasping one of its necks with the other head and rolling across the ground like a hoop. <laughs> an Enfisbena is an aggressive and territorial creature, attacking any living creatures that wander near its lair. It attacks by biting with its poisonous fangs from both of its heads." End quote. That is the funniest thing that I've heard in my life. But anyways, moving on. So, so yeah, you need an egg from this thing. And then the other rare ingredient would be the venom of an Ophidian which actually makes a lot of sense. So, so these guys are, are really interesting because uh, they effectively do function like lycanthropes. Uh, they kind of look like UNT abominations. Here's a picture of them in that they are, they're, they're basically mostly serpent with human hands. The main difference here is that if this creature bites you, you literally contract something very close to lycanthropy where you turn into an Ophidian yourself in about 20 or so days. It's like a lycanthropic poison. This creature's venom can turn others into more of its kind, and it appears to be a primary component to the infamous black broth that, as you can imagine, uh, turns humans into UNT. Now, the process of creating the concoction goes as follows, quote, First, a fire pit is dug and filled with peat. The human hair is wrapped about a stick, lit and laid on the peat. A sticks to snakes spell is cast to turn the stick into a snake, which rides burning the peat and sets it alight. Over this fire, the Ophidian venom is distilled into a syrupy black liquid. Another container is lined with the sunflower petals and seeds, which are in turn coated with the contents of the Amphisbaena's egg. This coating is accomplished by a UNT crushing the egg in its hands and lightly spreading it over the petals and seeds. 
The powdered gemstone is then added into the mixture while the dragonfly eyes are added to the boiling venom. After the eyes have been mixed in, this substance is poured onto the other container. As soon as this is accomplished, the blood is added, drop by drop, alternating types with each drop, and a polymorph other spell is cast upon the entire mixture. Uh, finally, at the consecration, the priest imbibes the potion of human control and then performs the blessing. The black broth is now complete." End quote. Now, I don't really want to go deeper than this, since again, this specific production of the Black Broth is Greyhawk lore and not Forgotten Realms lore, but I figured that you guys would get a kick out of this. It's really good info anyhow. Now, in any case, the, the last thing that I want to cover on this video are the Anathemas, which as you may know, they are the most powerful type of UNT. Now, they don't really make an appearance on the Monster Manual, but instead they appear on Volo's Guide to Monsters. In here, we're told that you can create one of these by doing a dark ritual. However, it does state that not all UNT are eager to see one of their own become an anathema, since anathemas brutally subjugate their lessers for their own evil ends. Going further down though, here you can see that they do talk about how they are the pinnacle of evolution. They talk about how they're basically demigods and how they are very successful at conquering other nations. Yet again, we go back to this passage that says that not all UNT are eager to get these guys to show up. Now the question then becomes, well, are the subjugations of the anathema worse than the abominations? Or is there something else that they are not telling us? It didn't really give us all the information here, so let's just go ahead and dig deeper. So, anathemas are revered as divine incarnations, uh, typically of either Mershalk or Seth. So, you would imagine that they would be fantastic for any UNT city. The issue is that they are, pardon the pun, anathema to the way that society functions for the UNTC. Uh, UNT are manipulators. Uh, they are secretive and subtle. Uh, they plan and think hard about how they proceed with all of their myriad of conspiracies. Anathemas are monsters of action and destruction. When an anathema shows up, it forcefully takes over the community and rallies them all for war against the neighboring kingdoms, which is great if the neighboring kingdoms had been weakened enough for takeover and not so great if they haven't. And the thing is, anathemas don't really stop, they just always keep going, finding more destruction wherever they go. Quote, Anathemas are extremely rare among the UNT, and UNT society as a whole seems not quite sure what to do with them. And they are never found in UNT cities, for the power they represent is such a destabilizing force that order and structure collapse around them." End quote. Anathemas are outside of the caste system of the UNT. In a way, they are above it, it brutally controlling the cities and leading them towards ruin. Now, UNT consider their physical form to be basically close to perfection. In fact, uh, their name, Anathema, actually comes from the fact that they represent uh, such a perversion of the original human nature that their very existence is like a heresy against all of the deities of humanity. And so, uh, these monsters are called Anathema for they are Anathema to humankind. It just so happens to be ironic that they are also Anathema to UNT kind. Now, because they are considered to be fairly holy, they are not killed. Remember that UNT venerate all reptile life, and they they religiously cannot kill it. It is also, by the way, another reason why UNT do not practice infanticide whenever they don't get the right type of abomination, for example, but I digress. They cannot kill the anathema, so they just banish them to live as solitary outcasts in the wilds. Not that this really stops them from creating havoc, but regardless, quote, most anathemas quickly gather cults of other UNT around them, sometimes involuntarily. And the most warped and unstable UNT of that whole warped and unstable species are irresistibly drawn to the unspeakable evil that the anathemas exude, and a violent cult is the natural result. A cult centered around an anathema is always a plague on the surrounding lands. No race or kind of creature can live in peace with such a cult nearby, for the UNT will not rest until they have obliterated any other civilization within a week's travel of their lair. And Anathema's only creed is annihilation in service to the great serpent who, the UNT believe, will one day devour the world." End quote. 
Hey guys, I, I don't say this enough, but you're all amazing. Yes, you, you specifically, you are amazing. Now, to pay me back for that compliment, make sure to like the video and comment. The algorithm is a harsh mistress, and at the end of the day, all that matters is whether you like and comment. That is literally all it cares about, and if you haven't subscribed, do so. Do it now. Now, lastly, as always, make sure to check out my D&D store, MrRex.shop. You need to just go and play as a dragon using my monster classes too. Get some levels in dragon, use a real breath weapon, not like those puny dragonborn. Play as a silver dragon instead, I promise you, it is a lot of fun. Playing normal classes is so old school now. Join the monster crew. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Barry Mascan, 5e Magic Shop, Morgan Johnson, Rusty Rain, Duck Feeder, The Great Codini, Omega Scales, Terry Culp, Falky951, Ordorix, Abim Kurshab, Thomas Hunt, Solus Rider, Stalia, Trev909, Trevor Hess, Stephen, The Living Guild Pack, Describe, The Wizard's Vault, Herbert Johnson, James the Perverted, Shoddy Cast, Jesse Feliciano, Lucas Syrek, Naktor Rashura, John Harley, John the Wicked, Shane and Sam Skinner, Sir Ignatius Thunderblade, Warren Smith, Wyvern Claw 00, Alisa Kestrel, Creasy 3, Merton Games, Loa, Falcon Scientist, Richard Sawyer, Mavrath Master of Secrets, Lauren, Vector X Men, Guy Broman, and Mediocre at Best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash Mr. Rex to support. Alright, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being here. Remember, comment and like the video, and I'll see you all next time.